Mm -hmm. um. Okay, I'm ready when you are. Okay, uh, well, now we're going to try to write a sonnet. Okay, just yet. wait, let me do a countdown here so I can, so I don't have a, any problems with it. Let me just double check a pan here. Okay. Five, four. Okay, well, now we're going to try to write a sonnet here. We're in my den here. Uh, whoops, there goes the pencil. <laughs> if, uh, if you can see here, this is sort of like the factory here. I've got poems here. If you pan over, that uh, are the folded ones are ones that have come back rejected. The other ones are ones to go out up there. Uh, bigger poems. Uh, here's my trusty typewriter and. Here's my notebook where I do generally smaller poems, mostly sonnets and whatnot. And as you can see, there's a lot of scribbling there, crossing out and whatnot. Uh, the purpose of this exercise is uh, I got the idea. There's a fellow uh, I know uh, in this salon uh, group started by this fellow from this list of Twin Cities artists that I started. And uh, one night at the salon, he showed a time-lapse photography of uh, or film of uh, him doing a nude sketch. I thought that would be interesting to do uh, a poetic equivalent of that. And so I'm going to try to do a sonnet since it's a small form. It has certain dicta that has to be followed. And so it, it's fairly easy. And also to show that you don't have to wait for divine inspiration. Now, <clears throat> there are several topics here. I haven't settled on a topic, but uh, the other day I was thinking maybe doing a killer sonnet. I've got a series of sonnets uh, uh, on famous killers in history, uh, international serial killers, uh, uh, gangsters uh, and and such. Uh, and I was thinking of doing a local guy, or fairly local guy, Ed Gein, who was the inspiration for Psycho and also the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So basically what has to be done here, uh, I think I'm going to go with that. I was thinking of doing maybe one on my childhood, or perhaps there's a paranormal incident about this uh, uh, Mattoon gasser, which was this person who apparently tried to gas people in their homes during World War II in this Mattoon, Illinois, or Ohio it was. Uh, but I think, I think I'll stick with uh, the Ed Dean one. I did a couple of more open and sunny and uplifting sonnets over the weekend, so I think we'll go for a killer. So the first thing to do is, is to get sort of, uh, if we want to take a baking metaphor, is to try to get uh, the ingredients. And so we have to look up for the historical elements. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, go and get my uh, encyclopedia or a couple of books on killers and look up a few facts of Ed Dean's life. And I haven't planned this, so... Usually what you want to do is get an end to a character, especially in a sonnet or, in, or a moment or something that stands out in their life, and that's the extrapolation that gets you into them. So let me get my, my, my uh, killer books here. As I said, uh, Yeen was supposedly the inspiration for the film Psycho. Now, here's my crime encyclopedia. It's not really that good of a book. It, uh, it's got a few interesting things here, but let me look up Yeen here, see if he's even in this book. Let's see. Uh, Yeen, 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 Yeen. Ed Yeen. E-F-D. Ed Yeen, 138 and 274. Let's see, 274. Uh... Okay, 274, he's only mentioned here, so 138 in passing. So let's see what they have to say. And what we'll do is we'll try, what I'll do is try to get a handful of facts to establish the Gein persona, because while he may be well known, especially here in the Midwest, you know, 200 years from now in Saudi Arabia, no one might know who the hell he is. So, uh, and probably don't know now. Okay, G, 138. Edward Gein, 1906 to 1984. Well, so there's the first fact here. 1906 to 1984. And Ed Gein, we'll just use that as a working title to start with. A very strange American, but ba ba crafted. Oh, it's a waistcoat. Okay, so let's see. We know he was a cannibal, and he made a waistcoat and belt from human flesh. And that's interesting. From human flesh. So these are sort of like the ingredients I put on the side. Uh, Gein's idea of internally equally bizarre. You want to use them as containers. Okay, so he used 
So he used skulls as bowls. And uh, I think also in the movie uh, Silence of the Lambs that Hopkins won for, the Buffalo Bill character there was based on Dean as well. So he's, he's had quite a cultural influence, at least in the slasher films of the 80s and 90s. Um, Slitting up side, hand of Frieda Ginga, he found in life, most friends of the in his capacity as a butcher, worked in the woodshed, block and tackle. Let's see, I think you got the right idea. In real life, Dean was a precursor to Dharma. For example, I did a Dharma sonnet called uh, Dharma in the Summer of Love in 1968, uh, set as a little fucked up boy. Well, you're going to have to bleep that one. But anyway, oh yeah, and here it. Gein's influence, yeah, Little Cat, Buffalo Bill, The Skin Transvestite of Silence of the Lamb, Brett Easton Ellis' American Psycho, The Ta Texas Chainsaw Mask, and Psycho, so yeah, so, uh, let's see, The Oedipal Motives, okay, that's always good, but that's overworked, but we can also use that as a, perhaps something looming in the background, the room had been nailed shut, okay, so his mom died in 45, mom died in 45, uh, he never enjoyed sex. Anyone before she died, Ma Gein drummed into the sex and masturbation was worth. So, uh, uh, let's see, sex before marriage, which is fornication and masturbation are sins. So in a lot of ways, he's very classic here. So what we're getting here is something that's going to need to have some other element brought into it. To, otherwise, we're just going to get, you know, some kind of edible fixation. And that's not really particularly interesting. Um, Ma kept in touch after she passed on, so okay, so he's talking to her. He was impressed by Christine Jorgensen's sex change operation. That's interesting. Uh, interested in sex change. In sex change. Household knickknacks, Gein's arrest, Ma Warden, ba ba ba. Two local girls ran from the train, Gein's home was raised. Uh, House of Horror, to his attraction. So let's see. Uh, house became attraction afterwards. So, let's see, so he was arrested, arrested in 57. So we'll probably what we want to do is do something afterwards because, uh, you know, I've done poems before on people actually killing and, and whatnot, and that's not necessarily the most interesting part of a killer. Uh, it's what goes into it, what, what comes after it. For example, uh, uh, I've done a pair of sonnets on Leopold and Loeb, the thrill killers from the 20s, and what was interesting about them wasn't the fact that they killed really, but uh, their homosexual relationship and how that played out. Um, let's see. Dean died on July 24th. Okay, arrested 57, died in 84. So that means he had 27 years to basically stew. Dean died as an ideal patient. So that's an interesting thing. Uh, he was an ideal patient and prisoner. So here's a guy who, when let loose in society to his own means, was a totally screwed up human being. But yet, when put into the strictures of someone else, of someone else's uh, care, uh, apparently was a, a good, solid human being, ideal patient and prisoner. So that's something interesting that might be used here. Uh, and there was a fan club. Uh, the belly button. Okay. So that's that's some basic stuff, and so, probably a lot of that is recapitulated in these two other books. But let me just flip through here. Uh, e. F. G. Gein. See if there's any other tidbits. Because what you'll want to do is always go for a couple of sources because it's like uh, getting a, a parallax, two or three perspectives. Uh, it lets you get depth perception rather than just flat. So here, Edward Gein. Ed Gein, America's most famous murderer. Well, this is a dated book, obviously. His crimes in front of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So we're getting redundancy. Born 8899... Oh, six. So he was born 1906, August 8th. Uh, Papa from childhood had been the biggest about masculinity. Again, Christine Jorgensen fascinated between 1554. So he was also a grave robber. That's another famous fact. But again, that's something that's probably not going to be something that's interest in the bond here. The choice of bits was specifically preserved. December 54, killing, and really his victims, and it, it sounds cold, but his victims really aren't that important. Um, the only poem that I think of, of a killer that I've done where the victim was, the, the focus of the poem was when I did a poem called De Salvo Unsolved about the, Unsolved about the Boston Strangler, and I did the poem based on the one black woman he killed, which was interesting because usually most of them, uh, he started out with old women and then progressed to white, uh, young white women, but 
there was one black woman that he killed, so that was the end to the DeSalvo character. Um, let's see here. Deputy skin decoration, skin so Basically, nothing in these books here that gives me two fresh vaginas. Hmm. Okay, so that's nothing in this particular book. Now, here's The New Murder is Who Who, which is generally the best of the books uh, that I've, I've used uh, published in Britain, Great Britain. Um, for example, here's a guy, just uh, Paul John Knowles. They did a sonnet called Paul John Knowles, Murderer, Rapist, Prognosticator. He predicted his own death. He was a real psycho, too. But uh, let's see here. Uh, AFGK. AFG, let's see. Albert Fish. That's the one you didn't like, Dylan. And there he is, the old guy who used to stick needles in his groin. Go fish. <laughs> Go fish. <laughs> Let's see, EFG, when we're going back here. Okay, John Wayne Gacy I've done. Uh, ah, here's Gein, and there's a there's a picture of Gein, just in case you didn't know. A little little dinky kind of a man, you know. Nothing, uh, but anyway. Let's see if there's any... Facts here. Middle-aged farmer, denied an interest, overbearing mother, worked at farm. So he's a farmer, an Oedipal farmer, tilling the earth, earth, mother, female, there's something there perhaps. His practice was a ghoulish in the extreme, 51-year-old woman, 54, okay, well, that was, okay, man, perverted pastime. Grave robber, necrophile cannibal, uh, film psycho, his petition, okay, he sought a sanity here in Okay, now there's an interesting fact. Uh, 1974, he seeks a sanity hearing. So that that's something that that may be. Uh, so these basically th these are things. I don't know how I'm going to use them. I might. I probably won't use all of them. It's only 14 lines that I can do. But uh, his petition was turned down by Judge Golmar. So that's a that's something here. Uh, Judge Golmar, sanity hearing at the Spanish and a model inmate. So those are the basic facts. There really isn't that much to work from here because uh, a lot of these ideas and themes have been recapitulated in other, in other more interesting characters. This was basically a loner. So let me get this stuff out of the way. So now, I, now what you do is, since I've got the basic facts of this guy's life, now we want to... We want to put them in some kind of uh, order, something that's an in, and I still don't know what. So this is why here's, I've got a sheet of, of lines that are interesting. So I'm going to scan through some of these lines and maybe anywhere from two to six lines that might interest me. And I'm not necessarily looking for violent lines since obviously anyone reading about Ed Gein and just the things that are going to appear uh, are going to portray him as a, a violent, fiendish individual. So you want lines that are going to stick out, uh, especially some that might stick out tangentially. Uh, or even something in total opposition that that can bring something into focus. Because sometimes you have to you have to be far away from something to get the get you know in order to understand conservatism you have to be an extreme liberal. In other words, um, let's see here. Doo -doo -doo. So I'm gonna scan through here see if I can get a few lines here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Evil must confuse to win. Now, that's a good line, but it probably Gein was probably not smart enough. Um, Pepper Pot, Perfection Lives, Twist of Theory, nothing in that sheet. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Well, here's a good, here's an interesting line that I may use, Fidelity is Ruin, because we, we know that uh, Gein here, as, as what it says, uh, is that he had a sort of slavishness to his mother's memory here. Uh, she died 12 years before he uh, was caught, uh, and that's something. Uh, and fidelity has a, is a word that has multiple meanings. Um, well, no, 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 no. Let's see here. Here's an interesting word, grabastic. It's, it's not a particularly poetic word, but it's something that it, it, it sounds like bastard. Uh, it has sexual connotations. I might use that somewhere, just because I don't know what if I'm going to take. I don't know physically what the poem is going to look like yet, but uh, it, it's something here. Let's see. Okay, so that's that sheet. Um, let's see here. Let's 
See, when I did the Dama sonnet, uh, I, I specifically showed how wacky he was as a, as a kid. I don't want to go in that direction because I don't like to repeat myself. I'm still trying to trying to find out the the, the in to game here. Um, let's see here. I don't want to do the hunting. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Here's a, here's a line that I, I got here. Smile is a hint of the skull. Now, we know he was doing something with skulls. He became a model prisoner. That's something that might tie together. So, smile is a hint of the skull. So these, again, are just like the facts of his life. These lines sort of provide a frame by which I can string the whatever I'm going to say about him. Um, let's see here. That one. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Uh, let's see here. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm trying to look now, see if I can make any connection between his life and some of the lines here. House, ideal prisoner. I don't, uh, my, my, my idea right now is not to do anything too graphic or violent because that would be too expected. Well, here's a, here's a phrase, a space and time. Uh, and that's from, a, actually from a, a 10 years after album from the, the early 70s, uh, 10 years after Alvin Lee. I've always liked that phrase, but this is something that might work in the poem like this because we know that uh, there was basically nothing in his life after he got caught. He was a model prisoner, so there's an emptiness there. Uh, that's some, that's a line that might work somewhere. I don't know if I'm going to use it, but a space and time. Thank you, Alvin Lee. Um, let's see. Uh, distractive. Distractive is an interesting word. Grabastic, distractive. They sound alike too. One of the things too is my mind generally. Uh, likes uh, alliteration and assonance, putting together uh, words that sound alike or have time. And also words like grabastic, uh, distractive, uh, they're, they're dissonant. They, they can be used even if, I get, even if I don't take a violent approach. They're words that in the mix are going to give a sense of, that he's, go he's, he's not quite there. It, it's the, the sound equivalent of maybe a, a facial tick or something. That's what we want to sort of compose, that this is the photo. The guy looks ghoulish, but more than likely when he was alive, people probably thought of him as an ideal neighbor, you know, a quiet, weird little man that was pretty harmless. Um, slip under your skin, flesh. That might be too... That's a line that could be used in a sexual poem, and obviously in a poem like this, but uh, I don't know if I want to go that... Uh, so I'm also looking for, for lines that might be totally not here, uh, not anything to do with it then. Also, the line wall, but then. Let's see. Singing as my lips turn slow to stone is an interesting line, and it's a first line. Huh. But I don't know, but just to watch like singing as his lips. I don't know whether I want to take the first person attack, attack, into him because I doubt he's that coherent. So I'm probably leaning towards uh, having a, an omniscient speaker. Um, shape the order of dreams. My hell is clarity. Don't want to get too explicit. Love chores, love tasks. You said you learned another man. Let's see. Oh boy, let's see. Well, here's a, here's a line that's a very Thomas Hardy-like line that might be interesting. A bow that for a moment sways or stays that I've been looking to use. Um, and that's something that would be a poem on memory, uh, but it would be interesting to put that in here. I don't, let me think how I might use that. Uh, bow that for a moment sways. Let's say maybe if he's looking out his window, if he's looking out his window, uh, that might be something that could, well, yeah, that's something. A bow that for a moment sways and stays. Because that would give me a way to start and end the poem slightly different. Let's see. A bow. That four. Uh, 
moment sways slash stays. So that's something I think that and it, it's an innocent enough line that uh, that uh, could have a have a nice jarring effect to start with innocence and end with some kind of innocence. Uh, and I don't know yet if I even want to descend into depravity. Maybe just doing a poem on Gein implies that. But then again, you have to worry or think about, you know, 500 years from now in outer Mongolia, is someone going to be uh, interested in this? So you have to you have to put a little bit something of his story in. That's always that's always uh, that's always a. Uh, uh, a concern in any historical poem, how historical are the figures. Obviously, someone like Lincoln is probably going to be known till the end of time, so you don't have to really do that. But you know, if you're, you're doing a poem on Madonna, you know, 50 years from now, no one will probably care about her. Um, nothing against Madonna. Um, let's see here. So let's see. Let's still got a couple of sheets to go here, and then we'll start uh, trying to put them together here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. You wouldn't mind some things against Madonna. <laughs> Well, I know she's always kind of skanky. I, 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 I prefer that little Jewel, that Jewel the singer, the little blondie. She's got a book of poems out, terrible poems, but come to me, I will teach you. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Here's a nice comic line that I'll probably use in a poem uh, about my father. Which ball did I come from, the left or the right? It's an interesting question, <laughs> but uh, I doubt, I doubt I can use it here. Um, inward breath of sex with trust and love. So now I'm thinking, uh, if I'm gonna, my 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 main thrust is now to have maybe Gein or 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 put him in some kind of idyllic setting. I think the idea of having him in some hermetic, sealed off uh, uh, place is is the way to go into this poem. And the the contrast between a word like sways and stays, or maybe starting stays and ends with sways. Uh, is something that that's the way to go here. Now again, if I were doing this poem tomorrow without the cameras and doing a poem on Gein, who knows what I'd come up with, but uh, everything, you know, the moment matters, I guess. Um, let's see. Lick your silver pussy. That's the line I'd like to use before. Um, tangle of mirrors. Mirrors is an overused uh, metaphor in poetry, though. Um, beauty by a word. That would be an interesting line to use in a Gein poem. You render beauty but a word, or who renders beauty but a word, some variant on that. I don't, I don't, that would probably be pushing it, because uh, um, again, if I were doing a poem on Ted Bundy, who was real smart, that was, that would be a, a good, that would be, I think I could do that, but you have to consider the character of the person. Um, Oh, let's see, I had no... Okay, even the touch and feel. So I'm now looking for, not only, but now I'm trying uh, to look for quiet lines, uh, lines maybe with some nature, um, uh, Edenic kind of lines. Because um, that, that's, I think, where I'm heading here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. How to twist the love out of that? I've used variants of that line before, but I don't know if I want to imply. I, I doubt Gein even sickly understood love, and if I'm speaking from a third per person, uh, I don't know. Once a woman's flesh and symphony. I use that line. Can't I to scratch that out? Um, heart remains a hot pot. Uh, love bids its contradictions. Last death on the last battlefield. Oh. Let's see, so let's put that there. Only you relate. Only it relates. A bow that for a moment sways, stays. Only it relates. Only it relates. Because we got the R's, relates, stays, sways, distractive, tease, grab basic. So let's try a variant on the line I've got here. Only it relates. That's, because now I'm, I'm thinking that also sound-wise has a lot of the T's and S's and the A, the long A sounds too. Um, so now I've got the, down to my last line. Hopefully I've got I've got enough here. But let me see if I can get one or two more lines. Um, okay. Pain is weapon feed on the canyon of rash shadows. Uh, but the plimsolls of the needy. Uh, this 
access the obvious trust, pettiness, seeking perspective. That's an interesting that's an interesting line. Pettiness seeking perspective. But again, I don't know how sum summarizing I want to be in this poem. Uh, and I can't do it if I'm doing it from the first person gene that's beyond gene. And it's probably too sum summary for a for a third person. Uh, let's see. <coughs> Let's see, what is the dream of save the dream, uh, as long as we end? Then there was life. That's, that's an interesting, let's see, about the four moments sways, and then there was life. Now that, since we know that, that he, uh, after being captured, spent 27 years in prison or institutions, it's interesting I, that... I don't know if I'm going to use that one, but that's that's an interesting line, especially for a killer. And it's it's a generic enough line that it's dependent upon other lines around it to give it texture and meaning. Uh, let's see. Failure of purpose. Nothing has changed. The, I guess I remember you. The seisms of spring. Um, Rinse and sands. Dust lights on that which dies. Darker than religion, I used that one. Let me go back. Sometimes you have to go through a couple of times. Because now, the first couple of sheets that I went through was before I decided I'm doing something silent and hermetic. So let me see here. Uh, not last, but first respects. Paying the last. Paying the first respects. Okay, death is the last respects. The first respects. That's, that's something, that's a twist on the line I've actually got here, but the first respects, that's something that might be interesting here. Uh, in this tenor, ah, bop, bop, bop. better to be harangued, the twist of theory. Let's see. Uh, let's see here, cancer-filled air, cut from the no, uh, smallness of this, smallness. Now, again, could recognize smallness. The smallness. Now, my line here is the smallness of this hand you hold, which is a variant on a, a love poem I did for this this singer girl I knew, Laurie Sinclair, a few years ago, called Girl with a Guitar, the poem was called. But uh, the smallness of something. Let's see, the smallness of... Now, I have him looking out, the smallness. The smallness of the window, the smallness... Well, so I'll just use the word smallness might appear near the smallness ellipsis here. I don't know what I'm going to use there. Um, you all fail. One day I'll stop and you will too. That's too philosophic for a Gein poem. Uh, lead to know you're alive. That's too blatant, I think. Life's a hunt. Uh, mountaintop, send me to death with a memory. Form shape. I like that one, but again, it's too, it's almost too uh, facile, religious. Uh, bringing sheaves. The word sheaves is interesting. Let's see, perspective fills itself. I've used that line before. Darkness comes upon the flesh, too obvious. Um, okay, let's see. Years resist their memories. That's, I've used that before, I'm tired of that variance on that line. Loves drip out of the penis, that's too blatant. Uh, let's see here. Music. That's the word music or muse. There's something that could be... Cause maybe, maybe he, he found some people. Mellifluous light of evening, I like that one. Because we can set it in the morning, and he can go from morning to film. The mellifluous light, of, and I even have the line here, evening, morning. So here's, here's where synchronicity comes in. These, both of these lines here, mellifluous light of evening slash morning, and then a bow that for a moment sways slash stays. So these are, these are things where I was thinking variants, and uh, now the Gein poem is focusing me in on light. And it's interesting because I was just, I was just looking before Dylan came... Uh, I was just looking through a book of paintings by Vermeer. So I've got an image now, perhaps, of 
Vermeer in a cell, uh, Vermeer, uh, Gein in a cell, and I'm trying to think of, of physical, instead of him doing something, just a moment, a snapshot, and how maybe Vermeer might have painted uh, Gein, uh, maybe looking out a window, and I don't know yet if I'm going to focus on what's outside the window, although probably since a bow that for a moment sways, so maybe I'm, I'm looking behind Gein, and here's this little man, and if I'm looking in the back, and I don't really have to describe him, just the name Ed Gein, uh, I think probably will will evoke enough, and it might not last for 500 years, but it'll evoke enough that having him looking at something out a sanatorium window is interesting. So that's where I'm heading now. I'm thinking, you know, <clears throat> Vermeer, Schneider doing Vermeer, doing Gein is a, a way to uh, go here. Um, let's see here. I empty the world for you alone. Um, your breasts overflow my mouth. Sun parts the gaps of love. My heart is a jackal that prays and lunges. That's an interesting line, but again, it's too, it's, it's too solid. Uh, Gein is someone who's lost, um, feeling what was felt long ago. Okay, that's a line that could tie in, feeling what was felt. It, it, it's memory, and it's using the same word in different forms, feeling what was felt. So, again, in a lot of my poems, anyone going through my work, a lot of people think most of the things that, that appear are violence, but without a doubt, the word memory, or remember, or forget, without a doubt, other than articles and conjunctions, those, those words probably appear more than any other words. So, again, this is probably trending to be a memory poem, maybe Gein in the act of memory, or, or maybe the... the, the or maybe even a third person remembering Gein doing something, I don't know, or maybe maybe Gein remembering and remembering Gein somehow. Uh, so let's see here. My average friend did with optometry. Um, so let's go one last page here, see if I can get one more line. Uh, I don't know where I am. How to twist on the map. I'm 10 after 2010. Most beautiful thing is ever breathed. Breathing the now, as if I spoke a thousand tongues. What of a nose which remembers frenzied aftermath of day life gives you shit? Loud handles of the mind, true courage, tangle of mirrors, eternity. Uh -huh, papa. Okay. Now sometimes, I mean, uh, there are times this is a poem I'm doing, sometimes I'll have just one line that'll get me going and then it'll come a lot quicker. But in a sense, this is better because it shows it shows uh, not being inspired and just trying to just trying to uh, cobble something together, the craft rather than than the divine inspiration here. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Best recognition. I love that. The black grass with keeping all so nice. Uncaused moment. Okay, uncaused moment that is this period. Okay, that's an interesting one, because now, okay. Uncaused moment, that's a Vermeer type phrase, the uncaused moment that is this period. And as the line shows, the period it's talking about is the period that ends that phrase. So I, I've got an idea now, uh, just seeing that line, uh, not only just trying to incorporate the visual element, but for the poem to acknowledge that it is a piece of art, that it uses things as periods, is interesting. So. Uh, we want to get a picture of Gein, but now this gives me the idea that the third person speaking in the poem is going to be acknowledging that this is an artifice. And that's interesting, and it adds levels to it. Um, so I think the... And what I, what I generally do is I try to use 10 or 11 syllables in my sonnets, unless... And I, I, I'm probably going to take the easy way out uh, and, and probably do that rather than try to do something more complex because... Uh, just out of time constraints, but uh, 
let's, I think, yeah, the uncaused moment that is this period. Let's, that's an interesting, because it, it's something you wouldn't think about a poem when it kill it. So let's try that. The uncaused moment is, the uncaused moment that is this period. Oh, perfect, 11 syllables. The uncaused moment that is this period. The uncaused moment that is this so now, but it, if I'm going to directly, so I have to drop the period. The, un, the uncaused moment that is this comma. Yeah. That is this comma. So right there, I've just gone, you know, I had that line, but these lines that I've got here are basically templates from which to, uh, so I'm, I've got ten syllables there because I want that line to flow into. The uncaused moment that is this comma is a bow that for a moment stays. Let's see, that's what I meant, is the bow. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to mention Gein in the poem. I'll have Gein in the title, which will be enough there. And uh, it'll be uh, an anonymous. And that, what that does, too, is it, it separates the title from the poem, and it, it makes them two equal partners that you have. If you read the poem separately, you're going to have one thing, and then the, the title adds another dimension. And since I want to acknowledge the artifice of the poem and the Vermeer-like dimension of looking at Gein, it gives, it gives a number of perspectival uh, uh, insights. So, let's see, the uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for a moment sways, is the bow that for but a moment sways, and but with but a moment sways, because I've already acknowledged the comma there and so even in the first two lines here the uncaused moment that is this comma and there's a comma at the end of this line is the bow that that for comma but comma a moment sways so the word but uses the comma it's a comment right one line in the middle of the next line underneath about the comma and the artifice of the poem and the word but there really shouldn't be in that line but it's the artist sort of intruding and saying this is an artifice now whether or not that's that that works I don't know, but it, I think it's interesting. And we haven't even yet gotten to the, the person yet. So now, now I'm going back to the original idea. I've got the introduction, I've got the insight into the poem, and now I'm thinking, okay, we want to get to Gein here. Oh, it's so much goddamn dust. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that... And I also have the use of the uncaused moment for a moment's sways. Uh, so I've got the word moment working there. And I don't mind using that uh, the, the same word twice in the two lines there, since I'm in these two lines it's announcing the artifice of the poem. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways. Uh, uh, as only it relates... Uh, as only it relates... To the day, as only it relates to the day, the, the unpleasant moment that is this comma, that's ten, is the bow that, is the bow that for but a moment sways ten. So I'm, as only it relates to the day, let's see, well, so I got the word day here, so I, and right now I don't, I'm not thinking of doing a Shakespearean sonnet or this sonnet. Sometimes I'll do without rhyme. I did a poem to a uh, sonnet a couple of days ago, Dene, which was unrhymed sonnet, but uh, with uh, syllabically correct. Um, but now since I've got sways and day in this next line, I'm thinking doing uh, an ABBA, uh, quatrains, quatrains, and I still don't know whether I'm going to do, you know, a, a Shakespearean or a Baudelarian uh, form here. But let's see here. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways, as only it relates. As only it relates. Let's see. As only it relates. Um, as, as only it relates to the day. As only its green relates to the day. Because um, okay, we want to get some kind of visual element. As let's see. 
Let's see. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow, therefore, but a moment sways as only it relates to the day, as only it, as only, as only it's, as only, as only it's motion relates the day. So we, uh, that gives me the ten syllables in that line. As only its motion relates the day. Instead of relating to the day, to relate the day is a more active because you're taking you're taking the image of the swaying bow and it's grabbing hold of the day rather than just being in relation to the day. So the dropping of the two there is good. Um, so let's see here. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day. So now I'm going to look for something comma, uh, er, ah, uh, 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 some, it doesn't have to necessarily be a direct rhyme, but I'm, I'm leaning and doing at least two opening quatrains here. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day. As only its motion relates the day beyond the bars, beyond the bars. And a word like bars always puts me in a Tennysonian type or Yeatsian type mood. Um, what is that? The pilgrim soul uh, kind of thing. As only its motion relates the day beyond the bars, beyond the bars, beyond the bars that would infer, beyond the bars that could, beyond the bars. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the days beyond the bars. Beyond the bars. Beyond the bars. That's the moment infers beyond the beyond the bars. That's the that's moment. You're not going to be able to see well because I, I'm dead right. That's why we'll be typing it, and that's the final thing where I f finally polish it. But uh, the uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow. Therefore, but a moment sways, as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars. I don't know if I'm going to bring Gein in at this moment, or should I? Maybe what might be most effective is not to let Gein come in until the very end. The uncaused moment, and that'll give it a Wallace Stevens type feel. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars. Uh, I'm looking for that other mellifluous light of the evening, morning. Okay, okay, I think I got that. Um, so I want to relate something to the time of it. Uh, as only its motion relates the day Beyond the bars. Beyond the bars that the time infers. Beyond the bars. Let's see. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars. That beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. Okay, now I just had the idea because Comma infers is a sort of slant. Infer comma uh, is is sort of a slant rhyme, and with the s there, but it, it works. I don't, and because in, in just reading here, I was going for the visual, but now I'm thinking not to do that because the uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow. So the comma is the bow, and so while that's the visual element within the poem, the comma, the artifice of the of of the literature of the poem, the words here, uh, the technique, is what is the bow, and I'm thinking. That's something be that's an abstraction. So that's why instead of beyond the bars, I was looking for a visual image, you know, be, that these bars or that this window infers. But I said, well, if I've got the comma here and the comma is the bow, then the bars perhaps on his gate can be the actual sonnet. And that and so now I'm thinking of making making the the actual poem form somehow the thing that hermetically seals in this person. I still haven't mentioned, you know, the murderous intent here. 
So let's see here. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. Uh, at the sonnet infers as the mellifluous light of evening as the morning, no, because I got mellifluous morning, mellifluous as the mellifluous light of morning and so I got morning, I don't need that and I had sways so, so I'm going to use some variant of the line, the bow that for but a moment sways as with stays and then morning with evening and probably at the end of this quatrain here or maybe not maybe it'll be at the because i'm thinking of going baudelarian four four three three in terms of line structure now um the uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that the sonnet infers as the mellifluous light of morning Inters, 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 his eyes within, that's one of my favorite words, Don Moss thinks I obsess on within and without, but what the hell, um, inters his eyes within this space in time, so I get, I get, uh, Alvin Lee back in this space and time. And time is also a great word because it, there's so much that you can rhyme with it. Um, so, okay. So, as you notice, I sometimes keep going, especially, I don't do this in longer three or four page poems, go back to the beginning of the poem, but with a sonnet here. I, I just try to get sometimes the rhythms and sometimes words come to me just by listening to the sounds here. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that this sonnet infers as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space and time, this space and time beyond, and let's see, I've got two beyonds, I'm going to lose one of them, but I'm just setting the first template here, uh, his eyes within this space and time beyond uh, beyond, beyond that place where he was so blind, beyond, uh, okay, wait a minute, because uh, I've got comments on, so maybe using the word rhyme itself, as the mellifluous light of morning enters his eyes within the space and time, beyond that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, beyond that joy, undeterred by his rhyme. So now, already here in the first, uh, halfway through, basically, the first draft here, I've already established that I, I'm too committed now with using the words in the poem, like comma and sonnet and... Just a second. Just a second. Oh. Is that a 90-minute paper? Um, it'll run, uh, two hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we should be able to get that done easy. Oh. the way this is going because uh, I was I was a bit worried that I was gonna do something that wasn't at least interesting you know I, I can you know it would be nice if I could just boom 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 pop out a great sonnet but um, already from the first time uh, from the first uh, just looking at the Gein info I, I've already gone far beyond what I thought um, and now in the first seven lines here I've got the word comma the word sonnet and the word rhyme so I've I've gotten the artifice of the poem well established within the, the rhetorical metaphor within here. So now the first half of the poem, the uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that this sonnet infers as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space and time beyond that joy undeterred by his rhyme, by this rhyme. And I've got 
I've got some nice little tricks going on here too. For example, uh, the end of line four, I've got infers and I've got a nearly dead on rhyme that starts line six, infers and ters, and it's just one beat off. And so it, it's something too that just rhythmically, if you're reading it and it, it's kind of, you know, I, I'm not a believer in, in metrics, the, the metric fallacy, I'll rail against that sometime, but by having a rhyme, you know, uh, at the end of one line and the beginning of another line, just two lines down, it's something that almost is like a record skipping. And it, it psychically uh, or psychologically implants in someone's mind that there's, there's a slip somewhere, which is good because that's something that maybe, again, you know, again, going back to like a facial tick, this is something that, that uh, just structurally implies a little bit off, something that's just not right. Uh, and we still haven't gotten into Gein really here. In terms of his eyes, because the only mention is his, so that's, Gein doesn't appear, or just his eyes. So let's see here, now I need to rhyme morning again. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways, as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that this sonnet infers. As the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space and time beyond that joy undeterred by this rhyme, where... He smiles, when he smiles, when he smiles, when he smiles in a way, just seeming, smiles in a way, just seeming. Already I've got the first two quatrains here. So now, now I'm midway through, and uh, I'm 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 looking uh, towards the ending here. So now what I'm doing here, because uh, I don't have any uh, in the first eight lines, I don't have any excess rhymes. So now I'm thinking of the rhyme structure of the last uh, six lines, and I'm not going to go four two. I don't want to do the Shakespearean because then that implies too much of a need for a bang a sacco uh, ending, you know, which generally tends to be moralizing, which I. I don't mind at times, but I'm going more for the 3-3 three, three Baudelairean or Rilkean uh, end here. So let's see. <sighs> when he smiles in a way just seeming to... Okay, because I had the line, smile is a hint of the skull, and I hear where he smiles in a way just seeming. So I'm going to take a version of that line here. Beyond that joy undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at the skull. To hint, to hint at a skull. To hint at a skull is only joy. To hint at a skull only it relates. To hint, to hint at his skull. To hint at a skull which only relates. To hint at a skull which only relates. Which only relates. And what I'm going to probably do for the six lines is probably do a, a, a B A and then B A B something like that. Um, or I might, I don't know, I'll, I'll see what the next line brings. I might just go uh, A, B, C, A, B, C. Um, so let's see here. Okay, um, so I don't have to go back for the first. So we, okay, beyond that joy undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull which only relates... which only relates to his past to his past with this poem that I got the piece on to, to his past with this poem to the to his past with this poem finds so distracted to his past this poem finds so distracted to his past this poem finds so distracted so here's a I, I'm just using a word because I like the if if sound 
uh, it gives me a lot to play with. Um, beyond that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull, which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive. Unlike okay, unlike because okay because we have the line is the bow for that that four but a moment sways in the first quatrain I'm gonna put it in the first tercet here too and that would be the end line summary there so it's almost like a, a, a the climax uh, let's see the hint at a skull which only relates to his past this poem finds so distractive. Unlike that bow, unlike that, unlike that bow, which for a moment stays, unlike that bow, which for a moment stays. So already I've committed now with this relates, relates distractive and stays to usually they but wait a minute relates stays that's close enough um, I, I could so now this the the twelfth line becomes important because uh, I don't know whether I'm going to do the off rhyme, uh, just the assonant rhyme of relates and stays, uh, or am I going to do uh, rhyming relates, distractive, and stays. <clears throat> so let's see here. Now I had I wanted to use the word smallness. So now I'm looking here at things that I have left over that I haven't used. Words like rebastic and smallness, music. And I have to still get in in the last terse at mellifluous light of evening. Um, mellifluous light of evening. Okay. Since I have that in that one, I'm thinking of... Okay, I don't have to use... I'm not going to use that one, I don't think. Distractive. Okay, I'm, I'm okay. I am going to, I am going to go, probably with the off, the off rhyme. Um, let's see here. Distractive. And it was life. Okay, so let me let me just get back into the narrative here. Beyond that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull, which only relates to his past. This poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow. Which for but which for a moment stays. Which for a moment stays. And which only likes the past. Like that moment stays. Within and here's here's probably my final uh, my final use of the artifice here. Uh, unlike that bow, which for a moment stays within. Within. I'm looking for something on the artifice of the poem here. Which for a moment stays within, because I also had the word within up there. Uh, unlike that bow, which for a moment stays within the poem, stays within. <sighs> unlike that bow, which for a moment stays within. And let's see, earlier the bow for a moment sways, as it relates to that, which for a moment stays within. Let's see. The hint at a skull which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow which for a moment stays within within the rhythm. Stays with within within its with within its rhythm. With within its rhythm. 
within its rhythm, within its rhythm or its beginning. In its rhythm or its beginning. In its beginning. Okay. Uh, here sometimes is uh, where you, you can get a little stuck and it takes a little working out because uh, uh, cause sometimes uh, it's difficult when you when you committed to some kind of rhyme scheme or, or a structure to try to stretch something out. Um, let's see here. <sighs> Undeterred by this rhyme where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow which for a moment stays within its rhythm or its beginning to end, to end, like his... rhythm or its beginning to end within its rhythm or its beginning to end okay so I haven't used any really violent images of him and I, I'm loath to do so I'm probably gonna refer to him somehow as a murderer or a, a monstrous in the title and let that just play off against the poem the poem has a very quiet Vermeer like feel so far and I want to sort of keep that uh, so that the title, in, a, in effect, almost acts like a pebble dropped into the still water. Um, now I'm trying to end it here. Now, I want to get the, the, the phrase mellifluous light of evening to parallel the morning earlier, and I've got beginning, so that's why I use the word beginning, so that I get the almost near, the, the rhyme of the ings there, the gerundas. Um, and distractive is the middle, is the, is the middle uh, sentence, or the middle uh, line in the, first terse set, so I'm looking to try to work in, and then there was life, or maybe even grabastic in there, um, to get an off rhyme, I'm not, I'm not committed to having, uh, you know, total rhymes here, but let's see here, let's try, sometimes we'll just force it here, and then I'll polish it up later, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow which for a moment stays within its rhythm or its beginning to end, to end, period, and it ends, to end and it ends, and then there was life, ten rhyme, and then, and then there is life, see I had, and then there was life, but then there is life because we're, we don't want to be looking from the past here, um, that is this coming, because I've been in the present tense the whole poem, so, uh, so it gives a very, uh, <laughs> Genesis-like feel here, but I need to get the last line in here, so we got here, uh, well, let's see, the first 13 lines, let's see if I can get, way to get the last line in, and then we can just polish it up a couple of times here. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways, as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that the sonnet infers, as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space and time, beyond that joy undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull, which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow which for a moment stays within its rhythm or its beginning to end, and it ends, and then there is life, the mellifluous light of evening, and then there is life, and let's see, and it ends, and then there is life, and the mellifluous light of evening, which gives a very painterly light port, and the, okay, so, and the mellifluous light of evening.
Now, I like this because Rumiya made his appearance in my mind midway through the poem. So now I've got, I don't know if I like, can hold this up yet. Now I've got the whole, you, you won't be able to, to make it out because I write like chicken scratch. But okay, it's been what, about 40 minutes here. So I've got the first, first draft down here. Um, and still the, the working title is just Ed Gein. But let me read the poem here and I'll explain what the strengths are and the things that have to, have to be tightened up here. So we've got Ed Gein. The uncaused moment that is this comma, comma, is the bow that for, comma, but, comma, a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that this sonnet infers as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space and time. Beyond that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow which for a moment stays within its rhythm or its beginning to end, period, and it ends, period, and then there is life, period, and the mellifluous light of evening. So we have the, we have the progression, especially, and it, it's odd, I, I rarely use rhetoricals, Whitman-like rhetoricals, and, and, and in a sonnet, but I think it works in this case because it gives a... Uh, I've had a couple of instances here with the, the slip rhythm of inters and infers um, uh, and uh, words like distractive uh, that give a sense of him being a little off here, but then end it end. So he's caught, he's in, he's in some kind of piece, and a word like and, and just the, the repetition of it, and, 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 gives a sort of, mm, 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 it gives a sort of rhythm that there's some kind of stasis coming to his life, and just the image of the mellifluous light of evening, he's getting older. So, uh, you know, we, I, I've got the mellifluous light of evening parallel, the mellifluous light of morning, I've got uh, the bow swaying and then staying, so we've gotten, we've got motion in morning, and then we've got, we've got uh, staying or, or a lack of movement in evening, so we get, we get the, we get the sense of time or something has come to us uh, getting more peaceful. I'm going to have to change one of the two beyonds. I'm going to have to drop. But now I'm thinking what the title is going to be. Because now that I've got the initial uh, outline of the sonnet, here's where, here's where the, the title might force some changes in word choices. Now, I'm, I've simply got Ed Gein. Ed Gein. So let me see if I can get a title from any of his life story here. Ed Gein. Um, I don't know if I want to put his date of birth and whatnot under there, but let's see. Ed Gein, Cannibal, Ed Gein, Waistcoat, Ed Gein, Skull, Ed Gein, Annabal, Ed Gein, Graybar, Ed Gein, oh, let's see, Ed Gein, Ed Gein, I'm thinking Vermeer, what's a Vermeer type title? Let me, uh, if you could just move your camera, I want to get a Vermeer book and look at the title of some Vermeer paintings, because I might use a, a play on a just Vermeer title. Can mm -hmm. I just walk by it? No, I'll just pause Now, I just got my Vermeer book here, Vermeer, the great Dutch painter, Magnificent Light, and uh, I'm going for a quiet time, and Vermeer, you know, yeah, Vermeer is, is the master of that, and I was just looking, finished looking through this book here. Uh, I mean, there, there were some famous ones, uh, woman, well, woman holding a... Woman holding a balance, uh, uh, and you know, Dylan was just mentioning to me that he thought Edgine in the Quiet Horrors, but I don't know if I want to do that since I think that's implicit in the poem. I want to bring, I want something that uh, adds a little more dimension to it. Um, a lady writing. So the poem Edgine doing something here. Let's see, Edgine, girl with a pearl earring. This is a great painting here. You can see her cheek there. Uh, just magnificent, the, the bone structure. Um, Ed Gein, let me see, let me just look at the titles. He's got the, the Ramea titles, it's gotta be, no. Um, Allegory of Faith, he didn't do much, The Love Letter. The Art of Painting, Girl with the Red Hat. Ed Gein, Ed Gein with a Ed Gein and the Ed Gein. Now, I wonder if I could, well, let me think. Ed Gein, hold, woman holding a balance. Ed Gein reading a letter. Ed Gein. So, let's see here. Ed Gein. Let's see, what, what is he actually doing here? Ed Gein becoming. Ed Gein becoming. Ed
Ed Gein becoming a metaphor. Ed, Ed Gein becoming. Because that, that's an interesting title, Ed Gein becoming, to, to be becoming, uh, meaning to become respectable, uh, someone who's becoming is, is, is appealing. And here we're giving a more appealing portrait of Gein, and also he's in the act of becoming something in the sonnet that he's becoming a metaphor, but he's also maybe becoming a, a peaceful human being. So I think I like that, because uh, he's not really doing anything. We're, we're commenting on him. So I think I like that I, that idea, Ed Gein becoming. Someone can fill something in, but also the word itself has many connotations. And I don't, I don't necessarily, I, I leave it up to the reader then to what they want to do. Whereas if I did like Ed Gein and the Quiet Horrors, I'm imposing too much on someone. So I like that, Ed Gein becoming. So let's see here. Now I'm going to do sort of a final draft here, and then I'll type it up and, uh, and uh, get here. So Ed, Ed Gein becoming, what the hell is today's date? Uh, Seventh, nine, seven, ninety-eight. Okay. Question. What? Ed Gein becoming at the point of the poem has he not already become? Well, you read the title first here. Um, without this here, we don't know if it's Ed Gein. We don't know that it's become because the first thing that we'd have then is the uncaused moment that is this comma. I mean, I that that that's a that's a weird kind of line to open a poem. We have no idea. Um, and again, I don't know if Ed Gein is that strongly mythic that he's going to last 500 years, but then again, in a sense, it doesn't matter. Um, I think one of the things, especially like, is I think I think it's a it's strong enough to, to use Gein because I think if, if anyone's reading my stuff in 500 years, which I think they will, uh, they're going to know that I've done Famous Killers and it'll, it'll, uh, it'll, uh, it'll invite them in. So let's see here, Ed Gein becoming. So now I just want to make sure that I've got syllabically everything tight here, and then uh, just see some other stuff, try to get some sound-wise here. The uncaused moment that is this comma, for, uh, we're in the present tense, the uncaused moment that is this comma, comma, is the bow that for, is the bow that for but a moment sways. And I like that but with the commas around it here, because it really comments right back here and says, this is an artifice. And... So let's see, that for a moment sways, what is this comma? And then I'm going to put a comma after here. This is a technique that I got, and I'll expound on this later, uh, from a guy named Lyle Daggett. He used commas a lot, and I don't know if he realized what he was doing, but one of the things with the use of commas a lot, it lets you be able to pull out phrases and clauses and make connections. It's sort of like that, that little child's game with 16 uh, squares, and there's one square missing, and you can... You can do things around a lot here. So let's see here. Is the bow that for but a moment sways as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars. Because we've got the day, okay. Uh, that as only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that this sonnet infers. Right, I like that. As only its motion sways the day. And I'm going to put a comma beyond the day here. As only its motion relates the day, comma. Because then we can take out that whole line and the, we can read it in another way. The uncaused moment that is this comma beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. So we're able to take out lines and shift. And, and what I'm doing there is I'm inviting the reader uh, to play with it and, and get what they want to it. it. It makes it more of an active poem, something that's engaging. Um, is the bow that for but a moment sways? And then you can read it also, the uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. So that's good, that the sonnet infers. The uncaused moment is this comma is the bow that for a moment sways the sonnet infers. So we've got a bunch of piling up of clauses here uh, and, and phrases. Beyond the bars that the sonnet infers, as the mellifluous light be beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. Uh, in, it infers as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space in time. Inter well, I've got a lot of ins in that line, I'm not sure. Inters his eyes in this space in time. Inters his eyes, inters his eyes within, his eyes within this space of time. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to, go against Alvin Lee here, inters his eyes within this space of time, this space of time, 
the word of, rather than, because in time is too binding. The space of time, we don't know how it relates to time. So that puts a sense of lostness too early in the poem, uh, just a relational lostness in the words that might imply early in the poem that the in is lost. So of here is a stronger word than in, and I have in, inter, within, and in. Three times in a line is a little too much. Two I can, I can stand, but now I need to get rid of that second beyond in the seventh line here. As the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within the space of time, in the space of time, without that joy. Within this space of time, without that joy. In the space in time, comma, without. Don Moss is not going to like that, but I'm the hell with him. It's my poem. Uh, without can be lacking and also outside of. The space of time, relation, without that joy. So we're, we're getting we're getting a lot of abstract comments, and in in a sense, I was going for Vermeer, but Ed Gein becoming it's interesting because uh, physically, if you're trying to envision the thing here, you're getting almost abstract abstractions here, but yet the abstractions are being built upon with specific images, like a a, a bow that's swaying, and a bar the bars, uh, Ed Gein becoming, and now. I just saw something because he's got the bars here. If it's Ed Gein becoming, we have to we have to date this somehow after after he has uh, been caught, uh, and that that'll be my sub subtitle. Ed Gein becoming. Let's see, 57. How long? He says he was a model prisoner, so we want him not to be too old. He died in 84 or 83, they said, and he was caught in 57, born in in, in 1906, 51. So maybe around the time he should be collecting Social Security. So it's, let's say, 62, 63, early 60s. And also that relates, too, because the 60s, quote-unquote, a time of awakening. So maybe at the same time, flower power and all that was coming in, Ed Gein is having an insight. So Ed Gein becoming, let's put him, let's, let's date this the, the year I was born, 1965. That'll give, that'll give someone uh, Ed Gein becoming. So he's been in, in stir for about eight years now. So he's having this this uh, transcendence here. Okay, within this space of time, without that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiled, without that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming, to hint at a skull, to hint at a skull, to hint at his skull, where he smiles, to hint at his skull, to hint at a skull, which only relates to no, it has to be a skull, because then it can be his skull, or and it gives a hint of the darkness. So the only darkness we really got here in this poem is the skull, uh, a word like skull, which itself is, is loaded with a lot of meaning, which only relates to his past, this poem, which only relates to his past, comma, this poem finds so distractive. So that the, the, the phrase there, putting a comma before and after, this poem finds so distractive, means that I'm giving the reader the ability to toss that out there from the narrative, if they want, to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike, unlike that bow which for a mo, that bow, unlike that bow which for a moment stays. Well, unlike that bow which for a moment stays, within its rhythm, and I have within the space and time within, within its, which for a moment stays, within rhythm, within its rhythm or its beginning. That's a really alliterative. Within its rhythm or its beginning. But that's not that's not because it's very mellifluous. It, it's short vowel sounds, so it it, 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 it it musically it moves. It, it's smooth with within its rhythm or its beginning to end period. But then we're getting that now. So we've gotten that smooth there, and so now we're getting to the summary here, the last two lines. Within its beginning to end period, and it ends period, and then there is life period, and the mellifluous light of evening. So that's almost like. I like that. Um, so now we're going to type this up, and I'll probably might change one thing here. But before we do, let's, I mean, just sound-wise, I haven't talked about the sound here. Um, I'm going to try to read it here, uh, 
and pause slightly at the commas just to give a sense of the rhythm and just the sound wise here. So Ed, Be Ed Gein Becoming, 1965. The uncaused moment that is this comma is the bow that for but a moment sways. As only its motion relates the day beyond the bars that the sonnet infers as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within this space of time without that joy undeterred by this rhyme where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull which only relates to his past this poem finds so distractive unlike that bow which for a moment stays within its rhythm or its beginning to end and it ends and then there is life and the mellifluous light of evening so i mean that i i like that um as far as the end rhymes, we have comma infers, sways, day. They're off. They're not, they're not exact, and I like that. Morning seeming is close. Uh, time rhyme is the only one that's really a direct rhyme here. And we've got relates, stays, uh, and beginning, evening. And then we've got the, the middle lines of the two tercet, distractive and life. So it, 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 it's close enough that uh, you can get away with it and having one that doesn't really rhyme, but it has the I there and the E. That's fine. Um, and what else would we have here, just to point out? Um, like I said, we have we have uh, we have the the swaying and the morning, and then we have the calm, the staying, and the evening, uh, and both with mellifluous light. So we have we have coming together the and 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 of the last three sentences uh, gives, and in a sense, the the use of the and 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 almost is is, uh, is a uh, grammatical recapitulation of the the eyes in the in the twelfth line within its rhythm or its beginning and 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 so we have a sense that the poem here is using devices and because we have we we've acknowledged that uh, we've acknowledged throughout that there's a comma sonnet poem that it is an artifice it gives a very it, it's almost like in a lot of Vermeer's paintings here for example one of Vermeer's paintings here. Uh, uh, quite a few of them. He has he's painting where uh, he pulls back the curtain. This is uh, the art of painting, and here's a curtain. And the, you know, it's almost like we're acknowledging that that's the art. And so, by using words like sonnet and poem, etc., and using these tricks here, we're we're almost like painting a portrait of Gein, but we're acknowledging that it is art. And so, therefore, it might not really be Gein, and it isn't really Gein since he's dead. And so now we're going to type it up, and we'll just, uh, we'll just, uh, my brother's typewriter, much better than that Smith Corona crap, I had two, of, I went through a couple of Smith Coronas in a couple of years, this brother has lasted about a year and a half, I didn't like the typeface when I first got it, but I got used to it. So this is actually the 120, this will be the 123rd sonnet that I've written for my Omni Sonnets 3 collection, and, uh, this is... I'll probably have another, uh, this is probably blocking you, I don't know if you want to, is the, is the light blocking you? No. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, whoops. We'll probably go to handheld though. Okay, well, okay, so I'm going to get my 12 pitch here, margin release, right margin. So now it's just a matter of typing this up, and I'm, I might, very little is going to change probably in the typed version, because I did most of the cleanup before I typed it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes, uh, you know, inspiration strikes and there's something nagging. But I like, I like, I like the painterly aspects here. So, let's see, 3, 7, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 16 spaces. So go to 48, and then we go to 40, and then we have my one finger typing, Ed Gein, Ed Gein Becoming, 1965, 1965, I know I'm so politically incorrect, I'm glorifying a murderer, no I'm not, I'm just trying to show, because the poem doesn't glorify his murderousness in any way, uh, so let's see here. moment is the uncaused moment that
that is this comma. And I just like to check myself because sometimes I do poems that have 15 lines and no one, no one catches it, not even me. Uh, I'm just gonna say I don't know if I have enough tape for your one finger typing. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. Oh. Is the bow that for but a moment sways? Is typed up, you can film it here because it'll, then I can explain it a lot more easily than here. As only its motion relates the day. As only its motion relates the day. Come. And the fact that, uh, let's see, where does the first period, the first period really doesn't appear until the, the 13th line. Uh, and, or it's beginning to end, which is a nice trick here, because that phrase, or it's beginning to end, and then three short lines, and it is, ba 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 uh, You have this long, and in a sense that, that uh, you have this long, m complex sentence that m mostly focuses on his becoming uh, uh, static or, or peaceful, but then you, you've got attention here, because, and it ends, and then there is life, and the mellifluous life, sound-wise, and what it says is, is depicting his calm, but coming after that long, complex sentence, it, it's not. It's very staccato, and so that's interesting. Uh, wait, wait, it's the day. Let's see. Beyond the bars that the sonnet, beyond the bars that the sonnet infers, and I am going to break it beyond the bars that this sonnet infers because I was thinking, should I do just 14 straight lines or go with quatrain, quatrain, tertiary? I, I'm going to go the Baudelarian route here uh, because beyond the bars that this sonnet infers, uh, uh, it relates to this, it, it gives the comma and the sonnet, both the first and the fourth lines relate to the poeticness of, of the artifice, and that's a good way to end a, a quatrain. Uh, as uh, whoops. Thank you for the correction button. Mellifluous. As the mellifluous. As the mellifluous light of morning. I just saw his, his, you put a comma there that wasn't there, so this is clean up. I did that because infers, watch, watch with this line, I'll tell you why I put that comma there. Inters his eyes with their eyes, his eyes within this space, inters his eyes within this space of time. Space. Now, originally here, if you can, I'll come back here, if you can see, I had beyond the bar that the sonnet infers uh, uh, as the malicious light of morning. I didn't have that comment at the morning. And so reading-wise, we, we were going, beyond the bars that the sonnet infers, comma, as the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes. We have a straight, we have a straight narrative here. Putting that comment there, we don't lose that because but we can also drop, that also allows the reader here to perhaps drop this line and just go beyond the bars that the sonnet infers, inters his eyes within the space of time, infers, inters, that reading that, that if you drop that line, beyond the bars that the sonnet infers, then the sonnet is also inters his eyes. The sonnet also is not only inferring, but interring something, if you want to read it that way, if the person, you know, so you're giving, you're giving someone more options there and you're not losing anything, and I've always, I always, I will always go with the, the multiple meanings. Uh, if I can, let's see, okay. Space of time uh, without that joy undeterred by this rhyme. 
out. Ah, like that. Nine. Undeterred. Nine. Without that joy, undeterred by this rhyme. Where? Like he smiles. smiles, come, or should I have the comma here, where he smiles in a way to hint at a skull, where he smiles to hint at a skull, where he smiles in a way, comma, just semen, no, where he smiles to hint at a skull, where he smiles in a way to hint at a skull, where he smiles in a way which only relates, where he smiles which only, where he smiles in a way which only relates to his past, I like the comma there better than here, where he smiles in a way to hint at a skull, yeah, that's a better that's a better comment. Again, okay, so where he smiles, placement of comments. Comments are very useful things. Uh, and this is a, a, a classic Schneider comma type poem. Where he smiles. Now, wait a minute. Where he smiles? Should I? No way. Just see. Now, see, if I put a comma at, if I kept both commas there, that's a little too much there. Uh, where he smiles. Where he, let me think here. No, maybe not. Where he smiles, comma, in a way, just seeming, comma. Hint at a skull, which only when he smiles in a way. Hint at a skull, when he smiles in a way which only relates. When he smiles, just seeming. Hint at a skull, when he smiles, just seeming, which only relates. No, when he smiles. In, uh, whoops. When he smiles in a way. Just seeming. Okay, so. Eight down, six to go. To hint at a, to hint at a skull which only relates. To hint at a skull. This poem finds so distractive. Unlike that bow, which, unlike that bow, which for a moment stays. Here in, uh, here in uh, the eleventh line, I didn't want to put a comma, for example, after uh, where he smiles in the eighth line, where he smiles, comma, in a way just seeming, because uh, it wouldn't relate to the next line. Uh, it would be confusing. But here I added a comma, for example, unlike that bow, which comma for a moment, comma stays, comma, because it'll connect well to the next line, to the next line within it, its rhythm. But also, too, uh, going back to the line that it relates to earlier, uh, is, is the bow that for, comma, but, comma, a moment sways. I've got basically the same line, but rhythmically, I've got here that bow which, comma, for a moment stays. So I have the, the phrase for a moment separated, a space in time for a moment, which relates back to that space of time, or, or it would have if I hadn't done the in, but uh, it's, just, it's just a little device that... What looks kind of the same, it's comma for a moment, comma, stays, uh, contrast against, uh, but, comma, a moment sways. So just technically, uh, visually, 
uh, sound-wise, if you're reading it directly and you're pausing slightly for the commas, it's just a little bit different, a little bit off, which suggests change, too. Okay, uh, he stays, uh, stays within, within its rhythm or its beginning. Within its rhythm or its beginning to end. I don't know, within its rhythm to end. The bow that which, no, beginning, to end, period, to end, and it ends, and then there is life. typos, uh, and then I'll explain just a little bit, and then, I don't know, Dylan, if you have any questions, or, or something that maybe someone watching this might want to know, I can answer. So let's see. Ed Gein Becoming, 1965. The uncaused moment, that is this comma, is the bow that for but a moment sways, as only its motion relates the day, beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. As the mellifluous light of morning inters his eyes within the space of time, without that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, where he smiles in a way just seeming to hint at a skull which only relates to his past, this poem finds so distractive, unlike that bow which for a moment stays within its rhythm or its beginning to end, and it ends, and then there is life in the mellifluous light of evening. So, I mean, line-wise here, we've got a lot of alliteration and assonance. The first line, uncaused, uncaused moment that is this comma, the, the C's and the M's. Uh, bow that for but a moment stays, the B, the B's and the T's. Uh, bow, but, then we have uh, that, but, moment. Uh, then we have, uh, then we have the last word, sways, then relates the day. Uh, motion beyond the bars that the sonnet infers. So we have beyond the bars, the sonnet infers. So we have an internal rhyme there in that line, which is good. As the mellifluous light of morning, the L's, mellifluous, and, and M's, uh, and the I's, the mellifluous light of morning, inters his eyes within the space of time. Uh, without that joy, undeterred by this rhyme, again, a lot of T's in that line, uh, and, and, and the Y's too, without a joy rhyme, where he smiles in a way, just seeming, uh, smile, the S and M sound there, smile seeming is good, to hint at a skull, which again, as far as I can tell, is really the only thing that suggests even violence here, which is, is really good. Uh, I, I went away from what would be expected. To hint at a skull, which only relates, so hint, relate, uh, to his past, this poem, BP, finds so distractive. I got a nice abruptive word in it, distractive, but yet you can toss that, that phrase out because it's got the two commas around it. Unlike that bow which for a moment stays, which I explained that line before, what it contrasts well against the line that it comments on, within its rhythm or its beginning, the eye is going crazy there, but it's setting a nice sort of systolic pace to end, and it ends, and then there is life, and the mellifluous light of even. So, I mean, that's it. Uh, Uh, questions? We've done it. Uh, well, what does it mean? <laughs> you probably go with the audio. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, is that, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, so we've seen here, and what we started about, about an hour and 15 minutes, I'd say, about 70 minutes here. So it gives us a good almost two and a half hours to do other stuff. But, um, so there, there it is. Uh, I, I think I've explained why I chose the title. I think we had a good idea of why. Uh, I chose certain words, uh, um, and this is, I, I have to say, uh, to pat myself on the back, I'm going to have to let this sit for a few hours. I don't know if this is a great sonnet, 
but I mean, it, 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 even if it's not a great sonnet and that it doesn't illuminate anything, technically it's damn good. Uh, uh, and th and that, that's one of the things that people have to realize is if you wait for the moments of inspiration, you know, you're going to be waiting a long time. And so I just put here done. Uh, but you have to develop skill. You know, there are, there, are, uh, there are people that I know who have a lot of talent, awesome talent. They don't work at it. You have to work at it. And hopefully in seeing some of the mind we processes here, uh, you know, I, I went, you know, I had, I had directions I was going and then I scrapped them because it, it wasn't working. Um, uh, I had the Vermeer thing, but there's some abstraction here too. Um, uh, there, there are nice images, the mellifluous light of evening, and it's, it's very classical. It's almost, uh, you know, a mellifluous light of evening sounds like it could be from Shakespeare, a romantic poet, but yet it's about Ed Gein. So those are, those are things that give, give it some gravitas. Um, I don't know what more I could, could say. Do you have but any... What, per what percentage of your poetry would you say is by divine inspiration? <laughs> uh, I, inspiration? If I see a beautiful woman... I, I, I can I can rip uh, rip off on something, uh, but uh, usually most most of these things here. If you see, I've got all kinds of ideas. It, it's, it's usually you know sometimes it's not just one singular divine or inspired idea. It's it's the concatenation of a number of things. For example, I did this poem. This was a Sports Illustrated from last year on the long count Dempsey Dempsey and Tunney, and uh, I did a poem. Uh, at least the first draft that I'm going to bring to the Uptown Poetry Group this Friday that I'm going to need to get some ideas. Uh, I, I had to get it out sooner or later, and I got this Thomas Jefferson, there's some books there, this Thomas Jefferson poem. Uh, there are ins inspirations, and it, it's finding the forms. I want to do like different sonnets or rondeaus, ballets within this long Jefferson poem. It's it's about sort of let it, and then, then it let it sort of just sort of come together, and then boom, one day, one Saturday, you know, I have five or six hours, I'll get out that draft, I'll bring it to the poetry group, I'll get a few comments, I may not change anything, I may structurally rearrange it, uh, but it, it, it's all about work. I mean, art is work. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's an avocation uh, in the sense that you can't make money for it, but it has to be your vocation. And so here's, here's yet another chapter in this one. And so that, that notebook is done here. That's done. And, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I generally, I generally give things a, a score between 1 and 100. Uh, I would say this is probably in the low 90s. Um, I'll have to read it. Uh, technically, it, I, I think technically it, the skill overwhelms what saying it at this point. But if I come back and, and look at it, because uh, I've, got, I've got my model notebook that I'll, I'll transcribe it into uh, at the end of the day here. Uh, I, you know, having, you know, eight or hours or so between time might give me time to uh, come at it fresh again. But I don't think there's anything that really can change unless I look and find I mistyped something here. But, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's pretty solid. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, it's better than I thought I was going to do, quite frankly. Because, uh, 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 and, and, you know, before you came, for example, I was looking at the Vermeer book, and the Vermeer you know, looking at a great artist gives you, you know, and like I said, when I originally put that down, the Vermeer idea didn't come until I wrote the first couple of lines, and so uh, that's you. You have to be open to all influences. You can't you can't segregate things out. You, you you're only you're only killing yourself that way artistically. Um, and uh, you know, this this is in a pro keen poem, and you know, again, throw out the title. What's it about? You know, Ed Gein becoming. I mean, without the title. You know, the bars, you know, the bars, I don't know. So, that's it. Maybe someday we'll do another one. Um, but uh, that was probably about 75 minutes it took from conception. Uh, that, for a, and this is a fairly, this is fairly complex, uh, this is a fairly complex uh, sonnet. Um, if I were doing, if a, you know, there are certain young ladies out there that uh, know who they are. Uh, if I was writing a love sonnet on, on one of them, and I was moved by their beauty, I could probably bang one out in 20, 25 minutes. But, uh... Nice pun. What? Bang. <laughs> uh, that's it. I well, when you say you can bang one out, were you talking about the women or the poem? Well, hopefully both. I'm, I'm into duplicity, yeah. <laughs> so there it is, and I guess that's it then, unless there's any other...